This is the third installment in a series discussing Japanese immigration into the United States, with an emphasis on California and, in particular, Placer County. Part 1 covered American involvement in the isolated island kingdom of Nippon and documented the lives of the first Japanese citizens to visit and live in California. The second installment told the story of Wakamatsu, the first Japanese colony in California. Part 3, 1894 through 1920. Violent anti-Chinese prejudice and restrictive laws reduced the number of Chinese laborers, creating opportunities for Japanese immigration. Cultural misunderstanding and prejudice created legislation restricting land ownership and in the Pacific, as both Japan and the United States acquired colonies, there was fear Japan was planning to invade California. Before the first Japanese citizens set foot in California, there was already bitter prejudice from white settlers against Chinese immigrants. As early as 1852, California's legislature began to pass a series of so-called anti-coolie laws. The laws sought to protect free white labor from competition from cheaper Chinese labor. Between 1870 and 1882, California's anti-coolie laws would be bolstered with new federal laws, limiting American naturalization to only whites and blacks. The laws were specifically aimed at Chinese immigration. Violent anti-Chinese riots occurred throughout the western states. Anti-Chinese sentiment was no different in Placer County. In 1876, Rockland was a sleepy rural community of about 800 people. The local economy was based on granite quarries, ranching, and the Central Pacific Railroad. News travels fast in a small town, bad news even faster. On September 15, 1876, residents learned that a horrible crime had been committed. H.N. Sergeant Javier Oder and his wife were murdered. Before Sergeant had succumbed to his wounds, he identified his assailant, Ah Sam, a Chinese immigrant. The town marshal quickly rounded up 15 Chinese residents, none of whom had anything to do with the murders. The following Monday, a vigilante committee was formed and ordered all Chinese residents of Penryn, Roseville, and Rockland to leave Placer County. Armed white vigilantes rode out, destroying Chinese camps. Fearing the Chinese held in custody would be lynched, the sheriff placed the Chinese on an express train heading east for Placer County Jail. The lynch mob rushed the train. The police officers and the conductor, however, were able to remove the lynch mob from the train and the train headed east for Auburn. The Sacramento Daily Record Union newspaper, while understanding the anger of the residents of Rockland, the newspaper condemned the vigilantes and called their action illegal and counterproductive in locating the actual murderers. The foothills were ablaze with vigilante justice. From Rockland East to Colfax and North to Grass Valley, Chinese communities were burned. There would be no arrests, nor would there be any compensation for their losses. Some of the Chinese took refuge on J.P. Whitney's Rockland's 18,000-acre ranch. Whitney employed the Chinese to build water ditches and rock walls. Violence and the new immigration laws had their effect. Chinese immigration in the United States dropped. With their lives in danger, Chinese immigrants began leaving the mines and farms for urban centers. The unintended consequence was that now there was a labor shortage for cheap labor. In the western states, if Chinese labor was excluded, who would lay the rails, pick the crops, and do the heavy lifting? 
18 years after Rockland's vigilantes tried to purge Placer County of Chinese immigrants, Japanese laborers would begin their journey to California. Japan was in financial distress. The need for labor in the United States created an opportunity to help solve their economic problems. By allowing Japanese nationals exit visas to work in the United States, the Japanese government felt that it could both relieve social unrest at home and, it was hoped, that their nationals working in the United States would also send some of their earnings back to Japan. To solve the labor shortage in the West, Grover Cleveland's administration entered into a treaty with Japan. The treaty would permit free Japanese immigration into the United States. In the month of March 1898, about 400 Japanese immigrants will have arrived at the port of San Francisco. Hawaiian plantation owners welcomed Japanese workers. After serving out their contracts, many Japanese workers returned home. Other workers chose to settle in Hawaii or make the United States mainland their home. One estimate of the numbers of Japanese leaving Hawaii for the mainland in 1900 alone at 10,000. When one thinks of the cultural differences between Japan and the United States, why would a Japanese citizen risk leaving his homeland for work in a strange country? As a contract laborer, Masatoshi Kojima, age 18, boarded a steamship for California. His reasoning was straightforward. Hiroshima was a land of poverty. Wealthy families had no reason to immigrate. Families of means had little respect for their poorer neighbors. When feuds developed, police would protect the wealthy and turned a blind eye to the poor. Japan was a patriarchy. The firstborn son would inherit the family farm. Not being the firstborn would have doomed Machioshi to a life of poverty. It was not uncommon for Japanese citizens who had moved to the United States to return to Hiroshima to visit their families. They returned looking prosperous. The streets in America were paved with opportunities and gold in Masayoshi's eyes. Masayoshi found life in Placer County far different. The streets were not paved in gold, only hard work. The San Francisco Labor Unions, the 1906 earthquake, the San Francisco Board of Education, war in the Pacific, the President of the United States, and an international agreement. With the anti-coolie laws in place, the mayor of San Francisco, the city's unions, and San Francisco's Chronicle newspaper turned their attention to closing the loopholes which permitted Japanese workers entrance into the United States. A new umbrella organization was founded, the Japanese Korean Exclusion League. On April 18, 1906, a massive earthquake followed by a devastating fire struck the city of San Francisco. Like the city, the schools were in shambles. In an effort to restart the schools, the San Francisco School Board would create an international incident. San Francisco schools were segregated. Chinese students could only attend the city's oriental school. While the Chinese students lived in concentrated areas, by contrast, the 93 Japanese students lived scattered throughout the city. By order of the school board, all Japanese students would now be forced to attend the Chinese Oriental School. The board based their decision on the 1895 United States Supreme Court decision of Plessy v. Ferguson. That separate but equal was the law of the land. The parents were outraged and complained to the Japanese consulate who relayed their grievance to Tokyo. The Japanese government demanded that Theodore Roosevelt resolve the issue. The Japanese government was deeply concerned on how their citizens were being maltreated. Roosevelt wanted the controversy quickly resolved. He had a keen insight 
into the new world order. Japan was a rising military threat in the East. In 1895, the Sino-Japanese War resulted in China being forced to cede Taiwan to Japan. Just three years after Japan acquired Taiwan, the United States defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War. As a result of the war, the U.S. acquired the Philippine Islands. Philippine rebels, however, wanted immediate independence. A bloody insurrection against the United States continued for another three years. With Japan in control of Taiwan, Japan's navy was less than 700 miles away from Manila and America's unstable hold on the Philippine Islands. In 1905, Japan shocked the world by defeating Russia. Japan would take full control of the Korean Peninsula. Speculation began to appear in American press that Japan and the United States were on a collision course towards war. Knowing the international ramifications, Roosevelt realized that there was too much at risk to allow the controversy in San Francisco to spiral out of control. He felt the school board was wrong and wanted a quick solution to resolve the controversy. Roosevelt dispatched Secretary of Labor and Commerce Victor Metcalf to San Francisco. Harper's Weekly caught the mood of the controversy. The petulant schoolboy represented the school district, the Japanese mother and her child clutching each other while Secretary Metcalf pleads for the district not to embarrass the administration. A compromise agreement was finally reached on February 15, 1907. The compromise became known as the Gentleman's Agreement. San Francisco's public schools would allow Japanese American students to attend their local schools. Japan agreed to stop granting passports to laborers. The United States would allow Japanese citizens to join a parent, spouse, or child in the United States. The United States would permit Japanese citizens to assume control of their farm or business. The United States would allow Japanese students to be admitted to attend the United States public schools. May 23, 1907, anti-Japanese mob violence erupted in San Francisco. The Gentlemen's Agreement did slow Japanese immigration, but Allowing a wife to rejoin her husband in the United States would set off another controversy. Passenger ships steamed through the Golden Gate, docked and disembarked their first-class passengers. The gangplank was then pulled up and the ship sailed on a few miles to Angel Island. Angel Island would become known as the Ellis Island of the West. Hour to an hour and 15 minute guided tour of that building up at the top of the stairs. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be talking about immigration into California and the United States starting from about 1910 to 1940. That's the main portion of our story here at this immigration station. However, immigration. The San Francisco's earthquake and fire destroyed the city's vital records citizens were asked to come to City Hall and refile their documents. Marriage records plus number of children. With little safeguards, fraudulent birth certificates were issued, permitting non-citizens entry into the United States. The new immigration station on Angel Island would try and sort out who could legally enter the United States. According to the Gentlemen's Agreement, Japanese men had the right to be reunited with their spouses. Between 1910 and 1920, Angel Island Immigration Station would serve as the entry point for an estimated 20,000 Japanese women. The majority of Japanese immigrants who entered the United States were male workers. According to the 1910 census, there were 72,157 Japanese residents living in the United States but only 12.6% were females. 
Japanese community leaders were concerned about the negative image of having so many single men. To create a more stable community, the ratio of men to women would need to be normalized. To solve the problem, Japanese community would turn to a traditional form of matrimony, an arranged marriage. In Japan, using a proxy for the groom, the marriage was recorded. After going through immigration on Angel Island, the women would disembark from the Angel Island ferry, meet their soon-to-be husbands, and then, to conform to United States law, a second wedding ceremony was held. There were many reasons why women would have wanted to become photo brides. There was the lure of adventure, acquiesce to her parents' wishes, or an effort to escape poverty. In America, it was believed, women would receive gender equality and would have greater economic opportunities. Not all the picture bride marriages ended happily. As a whole, however, stable families were established. A new generation of children would be born. They were known as Nisei and would become the first generation of Japanese Americans. By law, they would be United States citizens. The photo bride program was met with angry opposition from white nativists. The San Francisco Chronicle referred to the women as prostitutes. There was alarm that Nisei children would receive full American citizenship. In 1920, to calm American fears, the Japanese government ceased issuing passports to photo brides. Just about every state in the Union had statutes prohibiting interracial marriages. California was no different. Originally aimed at preventing African Americans from marrying whites, Western states began to add prohibitions against interracial marriages between whites and Asians. The 1880 law would remain the law of the land until 1948 when the law was finally repealed. In Placer County, mines and quarries were closing. Mining towns would disappear. Demographics would change as Placer County would become one of the state's major agricultural centers. By 1909, Japanese immigrants had discovered Placer County. They had purchased 11 farms equaling 442 acres. They had leased another 164 farms totaling an additional 6,500 acres. Land leased by Japanese farmers increased the land value. Even acreage with poor soil increased in value. Because of higher productivity, land that once rented for $25 per acre now earned $40 per acre. Average also increased the land value. What once sold for $100 an acre now returned $250 per acre. Those who leased land were happy with their new profits. White farmers were quick to express their displeasure. The Japanese were clannish. They worked too hard. Their children were taking over the schools. They shop and trade only with their own race. Farm laborers quickly learned that they were at a distinct disadvantage. Both Mexican and Japanese workers began to organize. Reverend Baba of Oxnard Methodist Church would help Mexicans and Japanese farm workers come together to form the Japanese Mexican Labor Association. Tired of unfair labor practices, they struck the sugar beet farmers. They demanded a more reasonable fee that they had to pay the contract companies who secured their employment. They demanded that they receive the pay they had been promised, and they demanded that they not be paid in script, which only could be used at company stores. On March 23rd, violence broke out. Random gunfire from the Anglo farmers was directed at the strikers. 
21-year-old Luis Vasquez was mortally wounded. Two Mexicans as well as two Japanese field workers were wounded as well. Soon after the violence, the sugar beet industry capitulated to the workers' demands. The JMLA asked union leader Samuel Gompers for admission into the American Federation of Labor. Gompers would allow the union to join only if the Japanese workers were excluded. In the Sierra Foothill community of Loomis, white strawberry farmers vowed to replace their Japanese strawberry pickers with white laborers. There was a growing fear within California of the rising number of resident Japanese aliens, and now a new fear, their children. The Nisei would have full United States citizenship. To thwart further immigration from Asia, the California legislature passed the California Alien Land Law of 1913. The law prohibited alien ineligible for citizenship from owning agricultural land or possessing long-term leases. Leases would be limited to just three years. Protesting the legislation, Dr. David Starr Jordan, president of Stanford University, sent a letter to the governor, Hiram Johnson. Both the previous president, Howard Taft, and the current president, Woodrow Wilson, both opposed anti-Japanese legislation. The bill passed the California Senate 35 to 2 and the Assembly 72 to 3. The bill was signed into law by the then progressive Republican Governor Hiram Johnson. Japan protested. They sent two representatives to Sacramento to lobby against the bill. The law was essentially unfair and inconsistent with the sentiments of the amity and good neighborhood which have presided over the relations between the two countries. Japanese farmers, in order to evade the new alien land law, began to form corporations. The San Francisco Call newspaper reported that in Auburn, California, Japanese farmers had in 1913 begun incorporating. The 1913 California Alien Land Law did little to thwart the growth of Japanese farming. By 1915, three-fourths of the vegetables sold in Los Angeles were grown by Japanese farmers. Just five years later, to close loopholes in the 1913 law, a revised alien land law would also forbid non-naturalized Japanese farmers from purchasing land in the name of their Nisei children. California newspapers speculated that it was inevitable that Japan would invade the United States either through military action or subterfuge. Valentine McClatchy, publisher of the Sacramento Bee, took a leading role in spreading anti-Japanese propaganda. General Homer Lee of the Chinese Reform Army predicted that in less than two years Japanese troops would be patrolling the streets of San Francisco and Los Angeles. February 21, 1909, the Los Angeles Herald. A former Secret Service officer stated that the citizens of California were being blindfolded by the great railways, that the Japanese are coming through the gateways of our shores, Mexico and Canada. They work for low wages, can exist where a white man would starve, and unlike the Chinese, he dresses like a white man. Oscar Strauss, Theodore Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor, asked Southern Pacific Railroad to report the number of Japanese passengers the railroad had carried over the past 18 months. August 1st, 1914, war breaks out in Europe. Japan would enter the war as an ally of Britain. Japan saw an opportunity to seize German colonies in both China and in the Pacific. The Japanese Navy quickly overran German-held islands of Palau, German New Guinea, the Marianas, the Carolinas, and the Marshall Islands.
With her new conquests, Japan now would have naval bases surrounding the Philippine Islands. With Japan's Pacific Empire expanding, William Randolph Hearst's San Francisco Examiner newspaper stoked the flames of conspiracy theories by publishing a fabricated story about Japan's plan to invade California through Mexico. Three months after the Examiner's fictional story appeared, the arrival of Japanese warships off the Baja California coast would once again create a new conspiracy theory that California was about to be invaded. In reality, Britain and her ally Japan were on the hunt for German warships. A Japanese heavy cruiser was the flagship of the squadron, searching for German raiders off the west coast of Mexico. The Japanese cruiser Asama a member of the Joint Squadron was assigned to search the waters north of Magdalena Bay. Tragedy would occur when she entered Bartolome Bay, also known as Turtle Bay. The Asama struck an uncharted reef, ripping a 40-foot gash into her hull. Immobilized on the reef in mud, not having a radio on board, the HMS Boyne was sent to San Diego to report the accident. On February 22nd, the Japanese armored cruiser Izumo arrived to aid the Asama. Not wanting to abandon the Asama, a salvage rescue operation began. Four other Japanese ships would arrive to help in refloating the disabled cruiser. A team of 700 workers began the arduous task. On May 8th, the Asama was refloated. She left Turtle Bay on August 21st, destination British Columbia, to complete her repairs. Feeding on anti-Japanese sentiment and a fear that Japan would support Mexico's effort to recover her lost territory, Hearst's San Francisco Examiner newspaper sensationalized the accident as a ruse. Japan, the paper postulated, was trying to establish a colony in Mexico, a base to attack the United States. The Los Angeles Times carried a front page story that Japan had just landed 4,000 troops with an additional fleet just offshore. On the very next day, the San Diego Union blasted the Los Angeles Times article as completely false. In the summer of 1916, Hearst newspapers published Edith Maida Lessing's anti-Japanese poetry. They lurk upon thy shores, California. They watch behind thy doors, California. They are a hundred thousand strong, and they won't be hiding long. There's nothing that the dastards would not dare. They are soldiers to a man with the schemes of old Japan. Look out, California. Beware. They've battleships, they say, on Magdalena Bay. Uncle Sam, won't you listen when we warn you? But while we watch and wait, they're inside the Golden Gate. For we have found out we can't trust the Japs. Despite denials, rumors of a secret invasion continued to swirl. It was reported that someone purchased 500 broomsticks. They were surely to be used as practice rifles. Thousands of so-called Japanese fishermen were rumored off the Baja coast practicing war maneuvers. January 1917, rumors swirl that Japan, Germany, and Mexico would form an alliance to attack the United States. The belief that Japan was planning to create an hostile colony within California or Mexico would not die. July 10, 1919, the Roseville Tribune's lead article was on Japan's intention to create a Japanese colony for the purpose of colonizing California. In part four, we will continue the story, beginning with the 1920 presidential election, or as the historian Kevin Starr noted, California's war against Japan. Part 1 and 2 of the series can be found on YouTube under Michael Stark 1 or under Roseville TV.